Hello and welcome again to my physics video lecture supplement series. In today's video I want to continue with my lecture concerning oscillations and waves and we are now on to part three of this lecture which is going to cover waves proper. So there's quite a few examples of what might be a wave. Sound for example is a wave. Um, as are obviously anything that's called waves on a, so waves on a string, waves on a drum head, uh, water waves, be it in the ocean or on a lake, uh, there's waves inside of a plasma, and then there's electromagnetic radiation, which is includes stuff like visible light or radio frequency waves or x-rays, etc. And today I'm going to be focusing mainly on mechanical waves. And we're going to have three requirements for a mechanical wave. Uh, basically, you have to have some sort of a source of your disturbance. So, for example, you can create mechanical waves in this bounce house arena by bouncing up and down on the mechanical bowl. So that becomes your source of waves. Also, if you fall off of the bowl, you might land somewhere on this and bounce up and down a little bit. That's another source of waves. Um, second, you've got to have some sort of a medium through which the waves can propagate. So this rubberized, air-filled arena is mostly the medium. Um, if there's sound, of course, those waves can propagate through the air, but mostly the waves we're concerned with in this little uh, picture would be waves that are traveling along this uh, rounded arena. And alternatively, you can create this, me uh, excuse me, you can treat this medium as a collection of oscillators which undergo periodic motion together. They've got to be coupled together though so that if let's say uh, in, in bulk maybe each one of these uh, stripes on this arena is a large oscillator. Uh, well then this oscillator has to be connected to this oscillator and it has to be connected to this oscillator such that when this one is up, these two need to be reasonably close to up. So if this one's at a maximum up, this one should probably not be at a maximum down at the same time because they're adjacent oscillators. Instead, it can be also at a maximum up or it can be slightly below a maximum up. That is, in fact, our third criterion. There's some physical connection between these adjacent portions of the medium, which influence each, each other. So in these case, the connection might be these little strips of, of material that connect to adjacent oscillators. So what is a mechanical wave anyway? Well, a mechanical wave basically consists in the motion of a disturbance through a medium. So what does that mean? Well, consider this series of pictures that we have basically of an object having fallen in the water. So in picture number one, the object is just breaking the surface of the water as it falls, and that's the source of the disturbance. In picture number two, you can see waves sort of rippling outward from that disturbance. The disturbance is still kind of present here. Mostly you see these ring waves, and then as time progresses, the waves get farther and farther out. Notice that the center here is almost back to being placid and calm again as these waves move away because there's not additional objects falling in the water to keep the uh, disturbance uh, going, as it were. In other words, there's not additional disturbances in the water. So these waves that are propagating outward from this point where the object splashes into the water are basically the disturbance of this otherwise placid lake. What's worth knowing is the matter of the medium itself does not propagate with the disturbance. We can see that in the case of water waves if you were to, for example, maybe pour some dye into the middle. Maybe, maybe what you drop here is a rock uh, attached to a container with some dye in it. 
and so when the rock splashes down the dye is released and the dye maybe spreads out a little bit it does diffuse somewhat but you're not necessarily going to be seeing let's say it's red dye you're not going to see red dye here on this ringlet you won't see red dye propagating outward from the middle you'll mostly see it sort of staying in in the center and and the reason why that is is because the medium itself is not propagating and and the dye is sort of mixing itself with the medium and if the medium was propagating then the dye would be spreading out instead what's happening is each particle in the medium is actually oscillating back and forth or up and down about a fixed equilibrium point what that means is that the water that you find in this piece of ripple is not the same particles of water that you're maybe seeing out here in this piece of ripple. Instead you have a particle of water that's maybe bouncing up and down or back and forth or oftentimes in a sort of circular motion both up and down and back and forth and that motion sort of causes other water molecules to begin doing that as well as the wave spreads. What mechanical waves do have though, what they do transport, is both energy and momentum. So although there's no matter moving with the wave uh, across a long distance, there may be energy and, and momentum. And so if you're standing in the ocean and you get hit by a wave, what you feel is the energy or the momentum of the wave being transferred to you not necessarily an actual forward rush of water. Now there is a special exception to this which is called wave breaking and that's for example if we go up a few slides to that opening you're gonna see some wave breaking occurring here. Wave breaking is you see all this spray sort of breaks off from the main piece of the wave and actually will surf down the wave along with the surfer. So the surfer is sort of riding down the wave the spray can ride down the wave, but the water that's here in the wave is not going to move so that this particle of water ends up over here. Instead, this is maybe moving around in a sort of circular motion like this, both up and down and forward backwards. It's not going to move so that this piece of water is here, and then sometime later it's here, and sometime later it's here, and so on. It might make it out to here in the oscillation, but then it's going to end up back over here somewhere later on. So before we get into waves as waves, let's look at a slightly simpler case, which is just a simple traveling disturbance. And maybe the simplest example of a traveling disturbance would be a single pulse moving along a string. So this is equivalent maybe to having a taut string, grabbing the end of it, and then giving it one shake up and down, sort of like cracking a whip one time. You create a single pulse or if you crack up and down maybe you create a double pulse, one up, one down. And that basically starts where you've grabbed the end of the whip and you know, that's your source of the disturbance. And it basically propagates out to the end. Now notice again the rope itself doesn't end up moving anywhere. This part of the rope basically stays here as far as X is concerned. It maybe goes up and down a little bit, maybe it moves a tiny amount towards the Y, but by the time the wave has moved to the end, this component of the rope isn't going to be over here. Instead it's just each component of the rope moves up and moves down. So we're going to take a simplifying assumption, which is that the pulse shape doesn't change. In other words, if it looks like this, uh, we'll call it a parabola, uh, if it looks like this basically parabola initially, then after it's propagated for some distance, it's still going to look like the same parabola. Maybe it has the same height as well. And when we first form the pulse shape, we're going to give it, you basically describe it by how much each component of the rope or each element of the rope is displaced from your equilibrium position. So that displacement is given by y. And y is basically going to be a function of x and of, since it's initially, 0. Um, so initially you have y equals f of x comma 0, which we might simplify just to f of x. And so this might be time t equals 0. We've first formed the whole pulse. Uh, 
and a little while later, some amount of time T elapses, basically this pulse seems to have moved along the rope. It has moved along the rope. And what happens is this point P is initially here stationary. After some time T, it may be no longer stationary at equilibrium. Here it's stationary at equilibrium. Here it's moved away from the equilibrium position. This peak is maybe initially at what we'd set x equals 0 to be. After time t, it has moved by v times t, where v is the speed at which this pulse is propagating along. So that means that the displacement of a given element of the string is actually going to be some function of x minus vt, where um, this displacement that's initially here at x equals 0 will eventually be here at x equals p, and that's after some amount of time has elapsed, t equals whatever this distance is over v, the speed at which this thing is traveling. So we might rewrite our function as y equals y of x minus vt, or y equals f of x minus vt comma zero. So what we've done here is we've re-expressed how this uh, disturbance is described such that we only consider the x uh, component and we include t through this propagation factor v. This is the speed at which the pulse is propagating. And so with a single pulse, basically you're going to retain the same shape at all time. And so it's going to have the same y shape as it did at time t equals 0. But the x's at which this shape occurs may have moved a little bit. Okay, so in general, we might write this as y equals f of x minus vt. So y is just a function of x minus speed speed times time, position minus speed times time. So this is displacement, this is the position at which this displacement occurs, this is the time at which this displacement could occur. Basically we take v to be the speed, we assume it's a positive, and so this expression actually describes this pair of figures. The pulse is moving from left to right. If you want the pulse to move in the other direction, from right to left, then you just reverse the sign of the v. So you have y equals f of x plus vt. So this is left to right, this is right to left. And this function can be sometimes called the wave function. And so sometimes we rewrite it now as y is y of x comma t. So we go from x minus vt to x comma t. And we'll see how that plays out with a series of waves later. Before we get there though, I should mention that there are two basic types of wave. So the wave that I was showing in my previous slides, the, the one with a single pulse on a string, is basically a type of transverse wave. The other type of wave is what's called a longitudinal wave. And these two pictures are basically showing a person who is putting a disturbance on the end of a Think of it as, as a reasonably taut spring or slinky. And so a longitudinal wave basically means that the disturbance is in the same direction as the uh, direction that the wave is propagating. So the disturbance direction is parallel or the particles or elements of the medium move parallel to the direction in which the wave itself is going to propagate. So this is equivalent to grabbing the end of the spring and shaking back and forth like this. Transverse waves, on the other hand, involve displacements which are perpendicular to the direction in which the wave is propagating. So the wave pulse is moving this way, but each individual element of the wave is moving up and down like this. And so this is grabbing the end and moving your hand up and down. This is grabbing the end and moving your hand forward and backwards. And you can get the two occurring together. For example, in a plasma, you might have mixing of longitudinal and transverse waves. In fact, ocean waves 
are very often a mixture of transverse and longitudinal. That's how you get particles that move in sort of a circular direction, whereas the wave itself might be propagating in this direction. So let's look at each of those briefly um, in turn. So longitudinal waves are very often described as density or pressure waves because that's a very common way in which uh, you get longitudinal waves. Um, basically what this consists of is a series of high pressure and low pressure or high density and low density regions. Now when traveling through the air, for example a sound wave, you actually get both density and pressure variations proper. So for example here's a drum and the membrane of the drum is struck and maybe the membrane initially moves in like this and then it bulges out. When it bulges out it compresses all the air that's very near the membrane and so that compression basically means that you now you have a very high density region of air and this region of air is also going to be very high pressure. So then what happens is the membrane flattens and then goes inward and that creates not exactly a vacuum but basically a rarefraction. Basically the, the air near the membrane has to expand into this membrane area and so it becomes rarefied, less dense, less pressure. And meanwhile, while this is happening, this air that is at high pressure is also high pressure compared to the air nearby. And so it's going to try and expand into the air nearby, which is going to create a new compression density region. And so you end up with this pattern of expansion or rarefied low density regions and then compressed high density regions with high pressure. And you can see that this is in the longitudinal direction. In other words, this individual air particle, each of these dots is sort of like a element of air or an air particle uh, blown up a little bit, shall we say. Each one of them basically is just moving back and forth like this. It's oscillating around a common equilibrium position or back and forth like this. And basically during the oscillation you'll have a period when you have this expansion region, all of all or most of the particles maybe have oscillated out of this. Not even necessarily all, could be half, could be a quarter, etc. You can get all of them in a plasma, it's called blowout basically. In any case, you get all of the, the particles that are oscillating maybe oscillate into a common region. So you have a particle from here that's oscillated here, you have one from here that's oscillated here, you've got one here that's oscillated here, you've got one here that's oscillated here, and so on. And at the same time, they've all of them that are oscillating have maybe oscillated out of this region. And then a moment later, the one that is here moves back to here, this one moves back to here, this one moves back to here, this one moves back to here, and over here this guy moves back to here, this one moves back to here, this one moves back to here, and so you get your high pressure region. So that is longitudinal waves in a nutshell. I'm not going to go through the Colorado FET simulation on waves, but I will show you sort of the setup, if you will, for doing a longitudinal wave in there. Um, again, this is the the simulation that's put out by the Colorado Physics Education Team. And it is basically a series of coupled oscillators. So these red things represent springs, the blue thing represent a particle or a mass. And you can set up a sort of longitudinal oscillation by pulling all of the masses that would have made a line right along here, pulling them over to the edge, and then releasing. And they'll basically all move together, hit this line of masses, or compress the spring to the maximum, and then the spring will stretch out, these guys will all move back over here, these guys will actually move over this way, then you have a compression here, and a stretch here, and then these guys start bouncing back, these guys start bouncing back, these guys bounce, and so on. And that's how you get a propagation of this wave. 
So moving on, let's look at transverse waves. So whereas in the longitudinal wave, all of the um, particles that are oscillating about their equilibrium oscillate parallel to the direction in which your disturbance is propagating. When we look at a transverse wave, the velocity of a given particle, the direction about which it oscillates, uh, the axes along which it oscillates, is going to be perpendicular to the direction in which the wave propagates. So we have this string. Uh, this is basically the source of the disturbance is this hand moving up and down. It creates a wave that looks like this. The wave has propagated so far. Um, in another moment, you'll see that the wave maybe is like this. Um, basically, though, any given element of the chord is moving either this way or straight down, straight up or straight down. If it's at a maximum or a minimum, then the velocity is momentarily zero, but the velocity is not left or right, and it doesn't have a left or right component for the particles of the rope, or for the components of the rope, or the links of the chain, or what have you. The wave, on the other hand, the wave itself is actually moving from left to right. So you can see here that this part of the rope is still taut. The wave began here. It has moved so far. In a moment, it will have moved a little farther. So maybe you'll see um, you know, a little dip here, and the hand maybe will be a little higher up here, and so on. And the implication to this, and this goes also for the longitudinal waves, but it should be even more clear here, is that we have to distinguish between the velocity of the elements in the medium and the velocity of the wave itself. So there's a wave velocity and there's sort of a particle velocity or a velocity V of X comma T, just like there's a Y of X comma T. So let's look at what a wave actually looks like, a simple picture of a wave. Um, once the wave has started in earnest, it's going to make a sign pattern. So this right here is sort of a snapshot, and this right here is sort of a snapshot. It's like being able to take a picture in a moment of time of what the wave looks like. And so initially, you get this red line here. and this parameter kw, we've talked about ks, the spring constant. kw is what's called the wave number. And it's given by 2 pi divided by the wavelength of the wave. So what is the wavelength? Well, the, the wavelength is a length. It's basically the length between successive crests or between successive troughs in a wave. So our wavelength is the distance from this peak to this peak. It's also the distance from this trough to this trough. It's the distance from this uh, zero point, this point where it's at equilibrium, got to go up, go down, over to this point. All of those are the same distance. And so this red guy represents a snapshot in time. The blue one represents a snapshot in time. And they represent snapshots at two different times. Time t equals zero, and then some time passes. And the distance between these two depends on how much time has passed and how fast the wave is propagating at. So this V represents the wave speed. Uh, we can This right here is, could represent a transverse wave or a longitudinal wave. Uh, both will make a sign pattern. This one is probably actually a transverse wave since Y usually represents a displacement. However, it could also be a longitudinal wave because this could represent the displacement of a particle initially at you know some position away from the source, the displacement in the direction along which the wave is propagating. So uh, Y may be in the same direction as x, but it really represents a separate parameter. This one, however, is almost certainly a longitudinal wave. It's a density variation. And this is usually what we will plot if we're plotting for longitudinal waves, either a density or a pressure. And you'll notice um, that there's one 
really significant difference between this wave and these waves, which is that this one does not have a negative value, whereas these do. The reason for that being that you can have a particle move a negative distance away from, excuse me, uh, move it to a negative displacement with respect to its initial position. You can't get a negative pressure, however. So here are a few new and some familiar parameters that go with waves. Um, period, amplitude, and frequency, for that matter, angular frequency, all have basically the same meaning for waves as they do for oscillators. So the period is how many waves pass by a certain point per unit time. Uh, excuse me, how long between successive waves. Frequency is how many per unit time. Amplitude is basically how tall is the wave. So going back up here, the amplitude of this wave is this maximum displacement, or it's this maximum change in density from the equilibrium. Wavelength, I described previously, is basically the distance between common points in a wave, such as successive crests or successive troughs. The wave velocity is the speed and direction of the propagation of the wave. The wave speed is basically going to be related to the period and to the wavelength by this equation. So um, for every one period, the wave will have advanced by one wavelength worth of distance. And then the wave vector has a magnitude, which is wave number, and plays a pretty similar role to the angular frequency, but with respect to space instead of time. So let's put these parameters together and see what you get as far as a traveling wave goes. So if you have a simple oscillator, simple harmonic oscillator, you can express the displacement as a function of time by some equation like this. So any given simple harmonic oscillator, you have a cosine omega t plus maybe a phase term. If the, your specific harmonic oscillator is, say, a spring, then you know that omega is square root of k over m. Okay, now the snapshot of the 1D wave that we took earlier is y equals a sine kw x, which is the same as the maximum displacement times the sine of 2 pi x over lambda. This could be written as a cosine uh, 2 pi t over period if you wanted the equivalent uh, to the 2 pi over lambda for an oscillator. So put those two guys together and what you ultimately get is an equation which can be used to describe the motion of 1D wave. It's basically going to look like A times the sine of 2 pi over lambda times the quantity x minus vt. So this looks like a y equals f of x minus vt. And since 2 pi over lambda is kw, then you have a kwx, and since v over lambda is the frequency, this 2 pi v over lambda times t is really the same as omega t. So this is your equation for a traveling wave. You can also add a plus phi term inside this argument to represent some phase. Let's look at a couple of quick examples, or maybe three very quick examples. So the first one, suppose that you see waves on the ocean arrive every three seconds, and they appear to be spaced 10 meters apart. So how fast are the waves traveling? All right, well, we had that equation earlier that says V equals lambda over T which is equal to lambda times f. So they're arriving every three seconds. This right here is the period t. They're approximately 10 meters apart. This is the wavelength lambda. So we would basically write 10.0 meters divided by 3.0 seconds. And so that should be 3.3 .3 meters per second. And that's the speed at which those waves are propagating. Second, suppose that the crests of the above ocean wave are 2.0 meters taller than the troughs. So what's the amplitude? Simple diagram of that might be that our waves look something like this. And what's just been described here is 
that this distance from here down to here is 2.0 meters. Well, the amplitude is just this distance right here, which should be also equal to this distance right here. So the amplitude should be half of 2, which is 1.0 meters. Finally, we want to know what's the frequency and wave numbers of the above waves. Well, the frequency, of course, is 1 over the period. And remember that the period was once every 3 seconds. So this is 1 over 3.0 seconds, which is about 0.33 hertz. The wave number, k wave, is 2 pi over lambda. So that's 2 pi divided by 10.0 meters because they were 10.0 meters apart. So 2 times pi is about 0.628, uh, excuse me, 6.28. And so this whole thing should be about 0 0.628 inverse meters. I wanted to make a quick note about uh, different types of wave velocity before moving on. Uh, basically, this term, kwx minus omega t, is sometimes called the phase of the wave, uh, or sometimes they'll use x minus vt to represent the phase. Um, therefore, the wave speed v is sometimes called phase speed, and the vector velocity v is the phase velocity. That represents this v right here. And you can think of this as basically being the speed of the shape of the wave. And there can be contrasted with this a, a entirely separate velocity which is called group velocity. And that represents the velocity at which the whole envelope of the wave propagates. And I'll show a little uh, gif in, in just a moment to uh, illustrate those two. But the group velocity is usually the velocity at which information is actually conveyed through the wave. So this is the speed at which energy and momentum and so on actually can propagate through this wave. The usual difference to, to illustrate a difference between group velocity and phase velocity is this. The phase velocity, V phase, we usually take to be something like a omega over k. Um, and, and this, if you do this math out, you see that this is basically 2 pi f over uh, 2 pi over lambda. And so if you cancel off the two pi's, you end up with lambda f, which is the same thing as lambda over t. That's the velocity that we've so far talked about, or the speed we've so far talked about. So this is phase speed. And on the other hand, we also have what's called the group speed or group velocity. And the way that we get that is that we use delta omega over delta k. Um, and that, of course, ends up often becoming a derivative of omega with respect to k. So derivative of the angular speed with respect to the uh, wave number. That, that is the angular frequency with respect to the wave number. And this is applicable typically if there are multiple frequencies of wave, uh, which we're not really uh, going to be discussing too much in this particular lecture. But I wanted to give a little bit of a heads up for this um, because it's worth knowing that, for example, um, in optics, you get dispersion of colors because of effects like this. Uh, for example, d omega by dk in optics often gives the speed over the refractive index minus some factor like ck over n squared dn by dk. This right here is the refractive index that you 
encounter in uh, optics. And so it's of a special interest if you go on to study optics or go on to study the propagation of light through various media such as say a prism or even a pair of glasses uh, because it describes dispersion. And so that's sort of a, our interesting aside for today's lecture. I will add that the Math Pages website has a decent treatment of group versus phase velocity and also uh, signal propagation. So with that said, I have a little animation here, or a little simple GIF image, which is here to show the difference between group velocity and phase velocity. And so you can see here you have a red dot, you have a green dot. And what do these things represent? Well, notice that the green dots are in fact moving. Here I'm putting my mouse right over one of the green dots and you can see that the green dot is moving away from the mouse. And you can also see the red dots are moving and they're moving quite quickly compared to the green dots. What's basically happening is the red dot is representing the basically the velocity at which a given peak appears to be traveling. So if I follow this red dot, I'm following this one peak in this wave and goes through here and so on. The green dots on the other hand are represent the group velocity are basically representing the speed at which this whole packet of waves as a whole is moving. So notice that this packet as a whole basically seems to have a more or less constant shape even as the peaks within the packet are moving. So green dots give packet as a whole, red dot gives individual peak within this wave. And the green dots ultimately represent the, the velocity at which information in the wave is propagating. Okay, I wanted to look at another version of our picture of a traveling wave. And basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at how a wave propagates in snapshots. So here's our first snapshot. We have a wave. Um, it is, we'll call this at time zero. This whole string has this wave set up. Uh, notice where the maximums are, notice where the minimums are. Uh, the, the two parameters that we can use for right now, amplitude is one meter. So amplitude is the distance from zero or equilibrium position to maximum displacement. So this is one meter and this is one meter. So that's our amplitude. Wavelength is one meter. That's the distance from consecutive equivalent points. So here is zero and our next zero that's equivalent to that, our zero that's about to be a rising zero, shall we call it, is here a meter later. Here's a crest, it's at about maybe 0.25. Here's the next crest, it's also 1.25, so it's a distance of one. And then here 0.75, 1.75, so again a distance of one meter. So what I'm going to do is as I click it's going to show what this wave does by advancing through one second. So one second later we've gone from blue to red. What has happened? Well, you could look at it as everything has shifted by one second's worth. So it looks as if the wave has moved through one quarter of a cycle or one quarter of a wavelength to the right. And basically each point has moved through one quarter of a cycle's worth of oscillation. So at 0.25 we started off at a local maximum. It's now back to the equilibrium position. At 0.5 we started at equilibrium. It has now moved to a maximum. At 0 we started off at equilibrium. It has moved to a minimum and so on. Now let's advance another one second. And so here the wave has propagated through one half of its wavelength. Notice that this maximum started here. This was at 0.25 seconds. Now it is here. This is 0.75 seconds. Uh, 
what, uh, excuse me, 0.75 meters and 0.25 meters. That's 0.5 meter worth of propagation. That's half of a wavelength, and we've done this in two seconds time. And you'll notice that as far as the actual individual elements are concerned, this one has started uh, at zero. It's back to zero, but it was initially, this one was initially a rising zero. Now it's a falling zero. This was initially a maximum. Now it's at a minimum. This was initially a falling zero. Now it's a rising zero. This was initially a minimum. Now it's a maximum, so on. We're moved through half of a period. And we'll advance another second. We're now three quarters of the period, and this peak has moved from here to here. That's three quarters of a meter, three quarters of a wavelength. And then if we advance one more second, we're four seconds, and we're back to where we started. So that's a, a set of snapshots of a traveling wave. This was a transverse wave. We could do the same thing if we wanted with a longitudinal wave, for example, a, a density wave or a, a pressure wave if we wanted to use pressure. The equation is a little different to describe this, and the reason why that is is because, again, you have some minimum amount of density below which you cannot go. Specifically, the absolute minimum seems to be zero. That means basically no particles per cubic meter. You can't go below zero particles per cubic meter. So at equilibrium, maybe let's say there's, it's basically a normalized graph. So there's one times 10 to the 21 particles per cubic meter or whatever your initial density is. And as time goes by, you get these oscillations uh, at each point about that one, that normalized one. And this basically goes down to zero. When this is at zero, somewhere else there are two particles per cubic meter and so on. So the equation looks a little more because we have to include this minimum offset and this maximum offset. So I wanted to talk a little bit about waves on a string and Basically, the thing with a wave on a string is that you basically stretch the string. You think of it as plucking it like a guitar string or hooking an oscillator to the end to wave it up and down. So it's basically going to be a transverse wave. And basically, the speed of that transverse wave is going to depend upon two parameters, both of which are properties of the string itself. The first parameter is the tension force in the string. The second one is the mass per unit length. So the force in the string is a parameter which is set already. Um, for a guitar, for example, you basically tune the string by uh, turning a couple little thumb screws on the head of the guitar, and they either tighten the string or loosen it. Uh, basically changes the tension in the string. The mass per unit length is just a property of the string as such. Basically, get the mass of the string, get the length of the string, divide the mass by the length, and now you have the mass per unit length. So mu is m over l. And the wave speed, as it turns out, is just determined by the square root of the tension divided by the mass per unit length. Or if you'd rather, it's the tension times the total length of the st uh, string divided by the total mass of the string. In addition to the wave speed, you also can consider the actual transverse motion of the particle in the wave. This is true whether we're talking about a wave on a string, whether we're talking even about longitudinal waves, although it's easier to picture in terms of a transverse motion. Basically, you have the wave itself, which is propagating here, maybe left to right. This is the source of the wave. And then your wave propagates. Take this point P. It basically is just moving down and up. And this point, basically, you can get a speed at which it's moving in this transverse direction. 
And again, this works for longitudinal waves as well. It's just easier to picture for a transverse wave. For a longitudinal wave, it would be moving back and forth like this, and it'd be the speed at which it's doing this. Um, in any case, we already have the displacement from the equilibrium, which is given by the amplitude times the sine of the uh, wave number times the position coordinate x minus the angular speed or angular frequency times the time that's elapsed plus some phase term if necessary. And so basically you can get to the transverse velocity or, or the individual particle or element of the string or of the medium's velocity as it oscillates by basically doing the same thing that we did with an oscillator. Um, if you're using calculus, that basically means differentiate. If you're not doing calculus, then uh, same argument that we used for oscillators still holds true. Basically, the transverse speed can be given by omega, which is the angular frequency times the amplitude times the cosine of this phase term. Transverse acceleration, you end up with a negative omega squared times the amplitude times the sine of this phase term. So this looks actually quite similar to the expressions that we had for the harmonic oscillator. So here again are the equations that we got for a simple harmonic oscillator and specifically for a spring, but of course this part of the equation is true for any simple harmonic oscillator. The, the big difference that we see here between these equations and the equations of motion that went with the uh, wave is for one thing that we're using a cosine here, we use the sine here for the wave, and then this would be a y instead of an x, and so the phase term has a kwx minus omega t plus uh, phi as opposed to just x equals a cosine omega t plus phi. So this is sort of uh, giving the displacement from equilibrium as a function of time for a particular uh, particle at a particular position, if you will. And then similarly for the speed and similarly for the acceleration. So again, here is the speed. This one is a cosine term for the simple harmonic oscillator it was a sine term here's the acceleration it's a sine term for the simple harmonic oscillation it was a cosine term and basically this kw negative and kwx minus go away and so you're left with for example omega squared a cosine omega t plus phase um, so what i want to talk about now is energy in a wave, energy that is carried by a wave. And your wave can be treated as a collection of coupled harmonic oscillators. And so to get the energy of the wave, you basically just treat it like the energy of an oscillator and then consider a whole bunch of oscillators that are connected to each other. So for a spring, as a simple harmonic oscillator, you'd have one half Ks, x max squared or, or amplitude squared in other words. For a generic harmonic oscillator you'd have one half times something that takes the place of ks has to have the same units kilogram per second squared as ks and then x might be replaced by the amplitude a squared and for a wave basically you end up with something of the same uh, general form of equation where this c term, this dummy variable, might end up being, for example, a 4 pi squared times mass times frequency squared. Usually it has uh, ultimately uh, a wavelength in it as well because usually when we're considering the energy of a wave we take one wavelength worth of oscillation. And ultimately, the spring constant actually has the same form. 
slight typo here, this should be a 4 pi squared m f squared. So let's look at how we go about actually getting the energy for a wave or, or how we could consider it. Simple method for considering how much energy is in a wave is actually illustrated by this diagram that I pulled from Surway and Jewett's text. Uh, basically, imagine that you have a pulse which is traveling along some medium like this rope. And the question is, is there energy in this pulse? And the answer is yes, because when this pulse gets to this block, it actually lifts the block up by some distance. And so that means that we've increased the potential energy of the block uh, while the wave is present. And so in order for energy to be conserved, that means there has to be some energy in this pulse in order to transfer to the block. And if you want to figure out what is the energy in this pulse, you can figure out, for example, how much energy could it, in theory, transfer to this block? What's the maximum energy that you could get to this block from this pulse? And if you want to get a series of waves or pulses, you just get the energy per wave, which is equivalent to the energy per wavelength. So let's look at that just a little more, a, a, a way of considering this, which is to say, instead of thinking of it as transferring energy to this block, think of it as consisting of a bunch of little elements. For example, the little braids in this rope or some element of rope would be a section of the rope. And each section of the rope, if there's a lot of these pulses moving back and uh, moving from the hand off to the end, each section is gonna be moving up and down. It's oscillating, uh, basically acts like a harmonic oscillator. And as you know, a harmonic oscillator has an energy of the form one half C times an amplitude squared where C is some constant, for example, the spring constant. And if you wanted to get the total energy, then what you do is you just add all these oscillators energies together. And so in terms of the wave, you, you convert the C into this collective C. And so then you end up with one half C A squared, and that ends up being the energy of your wavelength. All right, let's do a more rigorous treatment of how to get the energy within one wavelength, uh, which is equivalent to getting the energy of one wave of material. So our more rigorous treatment begins by saying, uh, let's, let's take as our example this string. And so each element in the string has a mass dm, and that mass dm we can convert, since it is a string, into mu dx. Mu dx is because of the fact that each uh, uh, mu is basically the mass per unit length, and so dm is going to be a mass per unit length times a length, and that length needs to be a small increment of length since the mass per unit length is just the total mass divided by the total length. And note here that if we wanted to do a, a 3D version of this, instead of doing dm equals mu dx, we would do something like dm equals rho dv, where rho is the density per unit volume, mass per unit volume and dv is a differential volume. Okay, so with that said, our small element of string is gonna have a kinetic energy and it's gonna have a potential energy. And so if we wanna get the total energy, we need to find both the kinetic and the potential, and then we're gonna add them together. The kinetic energy of our element is going to be given by dk because, again, it's a small element of the string's length. Small, small element of string, small element of kinetic energy. And kinetic energy always, for us, we're talking translational kinetic energy, is just one half mv squared. So in the context of this string, 
we use dk equals one half dm v squared y. And v squared y comes from the speed of the oscillating element. This is on a string, it's basically the transverse instantaneous speed of that small element of string. So you obtain it using vy equals dy dt, where y again is the displacement of a given element at position x. So y has this form and therefore uh, vy is going to have a form like this, negative omega a cosine times kwx minus omega t plus phi. So that's where these terms are going to be coming from. Put all that together and you get the kinetic energy of a single element of the medium. dk is one half times mu times basically each of these terms get squared. So you have omega squared, a squared, cosine squared of this phase. And with that said, we're interested, because energy is going to be conserved here, we can just take a snapshot in time. And by taking that snapshot in time, what that does is convert this cosine term into just a cosine kwx. So we get rid of the phase phi, we get rid of the omega t part. Uh, again, this is because the energy is going to be conserved. So if we take the kinetic energy instantaneous of an element at one particular time, uh, we've, we've basically done our job here. The same thing works, by the way, for potential energy because just kinetic energy and potential energy are going to be transferred from or, or transformed from one form to another at any given time. So if we find the total kinetic energy and then the total potential energy through uh, one wavelength worth, we've got the total energy. It doesn't matter what time we take this at. All right, so with that said, now let's consider the potential energy of one of these elements of the medium. So we're going to do this by way of considering how you get the potential energy for a spring. Uh, because again, each element is acting like a simple harmonic oscillator. That basically means that we can model it like a single mass on the end of a spring. And so the mass on the end of the spring has mass dm. And for a spring, the restoring force is given by the spring constant times the displacement from equilibrium. And for a spring, that becomes omega squared times m for the spring constant times y. So let's look at how that comes about. Recall that a spring, we found that the uh, angular frequency is given by the square root of ks over m. Okay, what that means is that if we want to solve for ks in terms of all this other stuff, we can square both sides. You end up with ks over m, and therefore you end up with ks is omega squared m. Okay, now that's where this whole uh, restoring force guy comes in. So the restoring force for a spring is ks times displacement from equilibrium. So that then becomes omega squared m times the displacement from equal. All right, to get u, you basically would do an integral of du. And again, for a spring, remember that u is basically 1 half ks times y squared. Well, this ks term is, again, going to look like this omega squared m term. And so basically du is going to look like 1 half omega squared times dm times y squared. So this right here is basically equivalent to this right here. So uh, du we're basically saying is 1 half dk times y squared.
Um, so the decay term is what's giving us these terms here. Okay, so dm in turn was given by mu, the mass per unit length, times dx. And so our whole integral basically looks like this. Integration, we're going 1 half times omega squared times mu. So there's omega squared, there's mu, y squared dx. And so this y squared term, basically we have to use y equals y of x comma t. And again, we take a snapshot at time whatever, t equals zero is probably the easiest. And so this thing is basically like an A times the sine of kW x minus omega t. And again, snapshot, this part goes away. And so you're left with this part of it, and that's being squared. And so this is what the integral that we're doing looks like. And if we want to get the potential energy in an entire wavelength, you basically do this integral from zero to lambda. In other words, we've set up an integral that looks like this. We're integrating from zero to lambda for dx over this. And y is going to be a squared cosine squared kw x. Ultimately, if you do that integral, you end up getting uh, by the time you do it for both the potential energy and the kinetic energy, for each one of those, you end up with a quarter of mu times omega squared times a squared times lambda. So let's look at that. So our integral is basically going to look like this. Um, we'll do for either one of them, really, doesn't matter. Um, k lambda is integral from 0 to lambda times dk. I'll do for the kinetic energy since I set up the integral for the potential energy. And this one basically ends up looking like from 0 to lambda of 1 half times mu times omega squared times a squared. So these are all constants uh, with respect to our dx. And this is times cosine squared of kx dx. And you either just do this integral because you know it, or you go look up how to do an integral of cosine squared. It turns out that when you integrate a cosine squared of k times x uh, dx, what you end up getting is something like uh, half of x plus uh, 1 over k. I'm basically going to distribute this k out. Uh, it's 1 over 4k times sine of 2kx. So that's what that integral is going to give us. And so we want to evaluate that from 0 to lambda. And so uh, remember that k is actually 2 pi over lambda. So if I put in a 0 here, I have sine of 0. That term is 0. If I put in a lambda here, I have 2 times 2 pi over lambda. Whoops times lambda, and so the lambdas go away. And I'm left with 4 pi, sine of 4 pi is 0. So this whole term doesn't end up mattering once we integrate over a whole wavelength. And so this is the term that actually ends up mattering. And so we have all these constants times, let's see, 0 and then a lambda. So this is just half a lambda. So you have all these constants times half a lambda. That gives us a quarter of mu times omega squared times a squared times lambda. And this is what the kinetic energy in one wavelength is equal to.
and you'll get a similar result for the potential energy. Um, again, you're going to integrate. You'll have a bunch of constants. You'll have a sine squared or a cosine squared dx. Bear in mind, of course, that if you have a sine squared of x, that that's the same thing as 1 minus a cosine squared of x. And so when you do that, this term ends up being, so this ends up having a 1 half x plus stuff that goes away. And then this term ends up being an x, so it's something like this. And so these two terms end up just giving you a half x again, and so you're going to get the same thing for the potential energy as what we got for the kinetic energy. What that does for us is that since these two are equal and they're both equal to this, if we want to get the total energy in a wavelength, we add them together. That's like doubling this, and so you end up with one half times the mass per unit length times the frequency squared times the amplitude squared times the wavelength. So this is the total energy contained within one wavelength. And if you want to find the power within one uh, wavelength, it's really going to be how much uh, energy is delivered per period. So you just divide all of this stuff by T and what you get that the power is one half times mu times omega squared times a squared times v, where v in this case is actually the the speed of the wave, the wave speed, lambda over t. For a single wave, single wavelength, you're going to get a power that looks like this. So this actually concludes my lecture on waves. Here are the various sources from which I borrowed figures, tables, that kind of thing. So I hope that you found this video helpful and I thank you for watching.